Well, amen. Good morning. Wonderful music. I, I really don't know any of these folks, but I sure have been blessed by them. One of the things that blesses me about them is they stay for the preaching. I, I think preachers ought to go hear the singers, and I think the singers ought to stay and hear the preachers. But uh, it's been a joy, always a joy to come to Mims. And thank you, Brother Jerry, for inviting me back again. And I hope one day that we can do this again. At my age, we better hurry. But uh, anyway, it's been a real delight. Thank you so very, very much. Take your Bible and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, I know sometimes people write in their Bible by a passage of Scripture the preacher's name and the date. Now, on January the 13th, 2005, I preached from this text. And so if you have my name written there in your Bible, I don't want you to think, well, he's been coming so long now, he has to repeat sermons. I'm not preaching that same sermon, I promise. Same text, but from a little different perspective, all right? So that takes away any criticism that might come. First Thessalonians chapter 4 beginning in verse 13. If you have found it, say amen. amen. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Most of you, especially those of us who have some winter time on our head, we remember Miss Bertha Smith. I don't know that God ever made anybody like Miss Bertha Smith. She was one of God's great missionaries. She was more part of that Shantung revival in China. She and Dr. Charlie Culpepper and some others. But Miss Bertha Smith never married. And somebody asked her one day, Miss Bertha, why did you never marry? She said, my answer is very biblical. I would not have you ignorant brethren. <laughs> well, Miss Bertha's gone now, but she left out a word or two. But I would not have you to be ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The Bible never teaches death to be a friend. Now, I know sometimes people suffer for a long, long time and when they die, we consider it a blessing, and I understand that. But the Bible never presents death as a friend. The Bible presents death as an enemy. As a matter of fact, the Bible says it is the last enemy that we shall face. But as people of God, we don't have to be afraid of death. We know that death came by sin, and that because we're sinners, death is in our future. We know that death is no respecter of persons. Death doesn't care how old you are or how young you are. It doesn't care how much weight you can bench press or if you're bedridden. Death doesn't care if you have a PhD or if you're self-trained. Death, death doesn't care about those things. And one day it will come to all of us and its cold, clammy hand will rest upon our shoulder and it'll be time for us to pass over. 
But Paul, in the book of 1 uh, Corinthians, he, he confronted death face to face. And he said, death, big boy, where is your sting? Grave, big boy, where is your victory? And you don't have it anymore. It's been swallowed up in the person of Jesus Christ. I love contemporary music like we've had this week. I'm a member of a church. Now, all of our music is contemporary. I hardly ever know a song they ever sing. But I've discovered I can read the words on the screen even if I don't know the tune, and that's worship. But old Jake Hess, if you're a Southern Gospel fan, you remember Jake Hess sang with the Statesman and then later on with the Imperials and then on all of those Bill Gaither videos. If you're like me, when you watch those Bill Gaither videos now, you say, dead, 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 dead. I told Mark Trammell, I said, Mark, don't ever let them put you in one of those big chairs on the front. You won't last long. But Jake Hess used to sing a song, death ain't no big deal. And I want to tell you, he's exactly right. Now, we all know what death can do. Death can turn laughter into tears. Death can leave an empty seat at the table. Death can silence a voice that has been a source of strength and joy and inspiration to us for many, many years. Death can invade our homes and take the ones that we love more than anybody else. I've been preaching here in this conference since 1997. That's 27 years. I remember the first time I landed at Bush Airport and Brother Gene and Miss Maveny were there in his old red Buick and he picked me up and Brother Gene and I came to be two of the best friends. We talked every week, but he's gone now. The first time I preached here, it was me and Junior Hill and Ron Dunn and Bill Stafford. I was 49 years old. Now I'm 77 years old, and they're all gone. The first one was Ron. Ron died of diseases I cannot pronounce or spell. He had so many illnesses, and yet the power of God was on his life. When Brother Kevin was preaching last night about the power of God on a person's life, I thought of Ron Dunn. Nobody I know of went through more heartache and suffering than Ron Dunn did. A young preacher told me not long ago, he said, I want to have a ministry like, like Ron Dunn and Manly Beasley. I said, oh, no, you don't. You don't get ministers like that by going to school. Those ministers come out of a life of sorrow and heartache and, and complexity. I would love to hear Ron Dunn one more time preach chained to the chariot. What a powerful message. But Ron's gone. And then Bill Stafford. Bill could take any verse in the Bible anywhere and preach on revival. I never knew a man like that. Wore those cowboy boots, usually wore a brown suit. When he would laugh, you could see every tooth in his head. But I would love to hear Bill one more time preach on revival, but he's gone. This past January, Junior Hill went to be with the Lord, one of the best friends I ever had in my life. He would call me, just tell me something funny. He called one day, he said, Bob, he, he was an evangelist, I'm an evangelist. He said, Bob, one day they're going to go into some old motel room and they'll find us there laying in the floor dead. And I said, now, Junior, if you've just called today to encourage me, you're, you have failed terribly. But I sure would love to see him and hear him once again. But those are voices that are stilled now. We know what death can do. But I want to use my time this morning from these verses and share with you some things that death cannot 
do. Death ain't no big deal. First of all, death cannot take away our salvation. In verse 13, the Apostle Paul uses two phrases to identify two groups of people. He says, I would not have you to be ignorant, and here's the first term, brethren, that you sorrow not even as, and here's the second term, others. That term brethren is a family term. We would translate it probably today as brother or brothers. You know, the people of God, we really are a family. We're not all members of the same local church. And we're not all rooters for the same football team. We don't all live in the same state or drive the same kinds of cars. But all of us, if we're Christian, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. Hadn't always been that way. There was a day when we were members of the family of Satan and he was our daddy and he had a chain around our neck and when he jerked, we jumped. But thank God Jesus came and changed all of that. And now we're members of the family of God. We've been born again. And that's a permanent transaction. The only kind of life God gives is eternal life. There's no bargain basement Christianity where you can be saved for six months and then if you hold out, you can make it to the end. No, 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 no. Salvation is eternal. If you've been born again, you don't have to be born again again. If you've been saved, you don't have to be saved again. If you've been redeemed, you don't have to be redeemed again. If you've been reconciled, you don't have to be reconciled again. It is an eternal transaction. Now, that word others, that speaks of unsaved people. And you know, that just may be the kindest thing God ever said about lost people. When you read the New Testament, they're called wicked They're called unrighteous. They're called the objects of wrath. They're called the children of the devil. But here, just that word, others. Maybe the kindest word God ever used to describe lost people. They're others. Now listen, we used to be part of those others. But thank God, not anymore. We're saved. And if you are saved... There's not anything that can ever change that. It is an eternal transaction. When God saved you, he saved you forever. Bob, are you talking about that old Baptist doctrine, once saved, always saved? Well, I don't have a problem with that, but I'm talking about the biblical doctrine of eternal security. When a person is saved, they're saved forever. And death cannot reverse that truth. Death cannot take away your salvation. Number two, death cannot cancel your hope. He says there in verse 13, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. I don't know of a sadder way to live than to live without hope. But as children of God, we're people of hope. And what is our hope? Well, basically our hope is that death is not the end. Three times in the verses that I read for you, when speaking of death, he uses the word sleep. Now, he's not talking about soul sleep. Soul sleep is really not a Christian doctrine, although there are many Christians who seemingly believe it, but it's not a Christian doctrine. When he talks about sleep, it is a metaphor speaking of death. And when you think about the word sleep, It always implies waking up in the morning. I stay in motels about 150 nights a year. They all look alike. They all smell alike. They all serve eggs that have never seen the inside of a chicken. (laughs) 
But every night when I go to bed, whether it's in Texas or Louisiana or Oklahoma or New York, every night when I go to bed, I anticipate waking up in the morning because that's what sleep is about. You go to sleep in order to wake up. And that's our hope. That's our hope. All of you preachers, we've all done funerals. I've done lots of them in these 60 years now of preaching. And sometimes you'll have a, a real meaningful service at a, at, a, at a funeral. I mean, sometimes God will just show up and he'll bring comfort and encouragement. And, and then there are some places, not every place, but there are some places when the funeral is over, the undertaker will come and pop the top again on that coffin and say, now everybody come by for the last look or the final viewing. Well, now folks, I want to tell you that's not the last look. You see, that's what our hope is. Our hope is that death is not a conqueror. Our hope is that death is not the ultimate. Our hope is that death is not the end because we're just sleeping metaphorically because one day we're going to rise again. That's our hope. And death cannot take away our hope. Number three, death cannot destroy our faith. In verse 14, he says, for if we believe, and folks, we do. We do believe. We're people of faith. There are many things in the Bible I don't understand, but I believe them. I don't have to be able to explain God to trust God. I've had the joy of preaching in conferences and meetings with some of the greatest singers of all time. One of my favorite groups were the Neelands. I love those folks. My, they're the re, they were the real deal. And you know, just a few weeks ago, they were four, uh, three of the four group, uh, then that group, uh, uh, Jason and his wife, Kelly, and then their daughter, Autumn, and her husband, and three others on the plane, came down, burst into the ground, burst into flames, started a forest fire, nothing left but ashes. No coffins were needed, no caskets, nothing. Nothing left but ashes. My, wow, they were such wonderful people. I do not know how to explain that, and I cannot, and I don't try. You just trust God. You see, faith doesn't mean you have all the answers. It means you put your faith in the one who does. He does. I don't have to explain him. I don't have to justify him. I just trust him. Faith. He says, we, if we believe. Well, what do we believe? He says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we do believe that. Hey, you can't even be saved if you don't believe that. The book of Hebrews says, for it, that uh, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, the Romans says, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. If you don't believe in the death and the resurrection of Jesus, you may be a Baptist, but you're not a saved Baptist. We believe something. And our belief is not based upon fiction. He says, for this we say by the word of the Lord. We have a sure word of prophecy in this book. We can trust it. God's word has lasted through the ages. Liberals have mocked it. Infidels have derided it. But it stands and they're molding in their graves while their spirits are crying out from hell. And the word of God just keeps on rolling. Doesn't matter what the culture says. Uh, we hear a lot today about culture change. Well, I've been a lot of times when I thought it sure needed to be changed. But I don't know that it's changing for the better today, probably for the worse. 
but the word of God. It doesn't depend on what culture says. It doesn't care, depend on what Dr. Poppycock or Professor Smell Fungus might say. It just rides. It's eternal. God's word is sure. And that's the basis of our faith. We believe that Jesus died. We believe that he rose again and that he has given us a sure word and we trust in that. And death cannot shake our faith. Did you know that the devil has only had to do one thing in the last 2,000 years to destroy the Christian faith. He doesn't have to read volumes of books. He doesn't have to have lots of PhD scholars. I'm telling you, all the devil has ever had to do is one thing to destroy Christianity. All he's ever had to do is produce the dead body of Jesus. And there wouldn't be any more singing there wouldn't be any more preaching. There wouldn't be any more church services. It would all be over. It would all be discredited if the body of Jesus could ever be produced. And listen, the realm of death is the realm of the devil. He, if he could find the body, he would sure know where it is. But he cannot because we believe Jesus died and he rose again and our authority is the word of God. God. So death cannot destroy our faith. Number four, death cannot stop a believer from going to heaven. I like to think about heaven. I think the older you get, the more you think about it. I've never been to any place like heaven. Now, most churches take good care of me. They put me in nice places. Now, hardly anybody ever does it as nicely as Brother Jerry does. I mean, we're over there in a swanky, swanky place. It's not a Jim Walter home, I want to tell you that. It's a nice place. But most of the time, I'm in a Hampton Inn or I'm in a Holiday Inn Express, and they're very, very fine, very comfortable, very nice. But I've never even been to anywhere that even approached heaven. Streets of gold. Streets of gold. Walls of jasper like a diamond. Gates of pearl. Every gate, one pearl. I, God had to make a big oyster to make those gates. <laughs> no sun or moon there. Jesus is the light of the place. Nobody ever gets sick there. Nobody dies there. There's no sorrow. There's no pain. There's some of you, you hurt all day long. You hurt. You have pain. No pain in heaven. My goodness. I'm looking forward to going. If you want to get up a busload today, I'll go. <laughs> now, I'd rather go to heaven from Alabama because the change wouldn't be quite as drastic. But I tell you, I'm looking forward to going to heaven. And you know, the older you get, you come to a place where you say, you know, I've got more over there than I've got over here. Amen. And death cannot keep a believer from going to heaven. There in, he says, and those who are asleep in Jesus will God bring with him. The only way he can bring them with him him is because they're already with him. Paul said to be absent in body is to be present with the Lord. I mean, the last breath you draw here, the next breath you draw is right there in heaven. I mean, it's sudden, it's quick, it's wonderful. What a transformation. Uh, you have a body and you have a spirit. Your body, you can see it. You can touch it. If you were a cannibal, you could taste it. Unfortunately, sometimes you can smell it. But you have a body. And you have a spiritual part of you. You can't see it. You can't taste it. You can't smell it. But it's real. It's real. And right now, your spirit is embodied in your body. But when death comes... 
All that happens, all that happens is your spirit leaves the body. The body's buried away and the spirit goes to be with the Lord. But one day, Jesus is going to come and the dead bodies are going to rise and we're going to be re-embodied. And our new body, oh, it's not going to be like this one. When I looked at myself in the mirror this morning, when I, it takes me a while to get to looking this good. <laughs> I don't know why you laughed at that. But in our hour, when I looked in the mirror, I said, thank God one day it's going to be different. Amen? A new body. New body. Death cannot keep the believer from going to heaven. And then number five, death cannot keep Christians <laughs> from a wonderful future of victory. Vict I like victory. I like my teams to win. I like my opponents to lose. That's our nature. We like to win. We want to win. And I'm telling you, we're going to win. I have a friend in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, He's a retired pastor. I preached about 15 revivals for him when he was pastor at Skyland Boulevard Baptist Church in Tuscaloosa, a wonderful church. And he'll call me from time to time. He'll say, Bob, this is Jimmy. We're winning. Bye. And he hangs up. And I tell you, I could attack hell with a water pistol every time he does that. We're winning, folks. We're on the winning side. We're winning. Our victory, the source of our victory is found there in verse 16. He says that uh, Jesus is coming again. He's coming again. You look what it says there in that verse. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. I like that. It's not going to be another Jesus. It's not going to be a second class Jesus. It's not going to be somebody that looks like Jesus, the Lord himself is coming. When Jesus ascended into glory, the angel said to those who were standing there looking up, why are you standing here like this? This same Jesus, the same Jesus that you've seen go away will come again in like manner. That's the source of our victory. We're not strong because we work out. We're not strong because we eat wheat germ and Cheerios. We're not strong because we go to the gym four days a week. We're strong because of Jesus. We're strong because of him. He's the source of our victory. And then he mentions the subjects of victory. He says the dead in Christ shall rise first. Do you know why Paul wrote this letter? Theologians tell us that some of Paul's letters are occasional letters. Now, that doesn't mean he sat down and occasionally wrote a letter. It means that he wrote letters in response to specific occasions, like when he wrote to the church at Galatia. There were some folks in Galatia, people who'd been, been converted, they'd given their hearts to Christ, and all of a sudden they were going back into the legalism of the law. And somebody reported that to Paul. He sends a letter. He says, oh, foolish Galatians, who has cast a spell on you? You don't go from grace back into law. And so he wrote them that letter for that. First Corinthians, oh, I don't know of any preacher that would ever want to be recommended to the church of Corinth. I mean, you talk about a troubled church. It was a troubled church. They had one guy there sleeping with his, either his mother or his stepmother. He was having an affair with his father's wife. So either one of those, according to the Old Testament, would be a wicked sin. And so, and then the attitude of the church at Corinth was, well, we're, we're broad-minded enough. We can accept that. And Paul said, hey, sometimes you can be so broad-minded, you're flat-headed. And then they were arguing about spiritual gifts. I've got this gift. I've got this gift. This is my gift. I got the better gift. Isn't that silly? So silly. And so Paul wrote the book of 1 Corinthians to respond to that occasion of what was going on in church. And here, Paul had gone into Thessalonica. 
He had carried the gospel into Thessalonica and he had preached and the power of God fell and people got saved and a church was born out of those new believers. And, and Paul had said, hey, Jesus died on the cross for your sins and he was buried and he was raised from the dead. He ascended into heaven and if you'll trust him, he'll save you and one day he's going to come back and get you and take you to heaven. And so a lot of people got saved and man, they were looking forward to Jesus. Come on now, well, I'm saved, come get me. Well, Jesus didn't come when they thought he should. And so one word went one morning, did you hear last night, old brother so-and-so died? He what? He died. And then a little while later, sister so-and-so, she expired in the night. She died. And so they were confused. Paul, you told us that Jesus died. He was buried. He rose again. He ascended. He did save us. And one day he's come. But you didn't say anything to us about these dead ones. Are, are they going to be left out? And Paul said, left out? No, no. He said, they're going to be the first ones to get in on it. When he comes, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then, those of us who are alive and remain. Every time I come here, I go out and visit the grave of Brother Jean and Miss Mavany. And, you know, I, every time I pass by a cemetery, I just want to linger. Because I'm always watching because if those graves start exploding, I know I'm on call next. You see, it doesn't matter it doesn't matter if you're alive or if you've already gone to heaven. When Jesus comes, we're all going to be a part of that ultimate victory. What is that victory? We're going to see Jesus. And we're going to have a family reunion. We're going to be caught up together with them. Yes, sir, Ron. I'll see you again. Yes, sir, Brother Gene, Miss Mavany. I'll see you over there. Yes, sir, Brother Bill. Oh, I want you to laugh for me and kick those boots out like you do. Brother Junior, sweet, sweet man of God. Yeah, Brother Bob, do you think we'll know one another in heaven? Well, my soul, we know one another down here. I'd hate to think you go home with the wrong woman today because you forgot who you brought. We'll have as much sense up there as we've got down here, amen? As a matter of fact, the Bible says up there, we shall know as we are known. And that means we shall know without any introduction. Nobody's going to have to walk around heaven with me, Bob Pittman, John the Baptist, John the Baptist, Bob Pittman. Hey, John, how are you? Fine, Bob. How? That's not going to happen. I've never seen John the Baptist, but the minute I see him in heaven, I'm going to know him, and he's going to know me. Ah, oh, Victory. And then we're going to meet the Lord. You know, I've seen all kinds of pictures about him. You go in, especially around some ladies' Sunday school classes, and they have pictures of Jesus. And, and I'm certainly not opposed to that. I think that's okay. But some of them make him look like a brick hair shampoo commercial. <laughs> the Bible says there was no beauty about him. Jesus was not a handsome man. His beauty was not external, it was internal. And I don't know what he looked like. I don't, I don't know how tall he was. I don't know how big his hands were. I don't know what size a sandal he may have worn. I don't, I don't know. We can visualize those in our imagination, but then that's all they are is imagination. But one day, one day, victory day we shall see him face to face and there's not one thing death can do to stop that death cannot take away your salvation death cannot cancel your hope death cannot destroy your faith death, death cannot keep you from going to heaven and death cannot take you away from that future victory. And he closes the verse, the chapter with this. Wherefore, comfort, build up, encourage one another with these words. I don't know how long I'm going to live. I hope I live a long time. A fella called me last week in Virginia and said he wanted to book me for October of 2026, two years from now. I said, well, I'll come, but understand, I'll be 79 then. 
So if I'm in heaven, I told him, Brother Jerry, to call you and you could come preach that meeting. (laughs) I don't know how long I'm going to live, but listen, I'm not going to spend the rest of my life beating people up and pushing them down. I want to lift folks up and encourage them to trust Jesus, to love him, to live for him, and serve him. Because death ain't no big deal.